This lecture is about European social theory in the 17th and 18th century and its representation of the liberal individual and his rights. These are rights associated with the ownership and use of private property. I will begin with the English philosophers Thomas Hobbes and John Locke and their distinction between the state of nature and the state of society. I'll then go on to discuss how later writers in the 18th century Scottish Enlightenment began to distinguish different types of society and to represent them as stages in a developmental sequence, that is, as historical stages of development culminating in modern or what they called commercial society. These writers may appear distant from us, yet they're fundamental to understanding how colonialism has been displaced from later social theory. This displacement is based on a series of misrepresentations of the beginnings of modern social thought. The first is the misrepresentation of arguments about the individual and private property as being an early imagining of capitalism instead of being understood in their proper context of colonialism. In this way, capitalism is falsely separated from its beginnings in colonialism. The second misrepresentation is that of colonial encounters with others as being encounters with people at different stages of social development. Here, the possibility of universal human progress is represented by European civilization to which others are led. In other words, modernity comes to be presented as a project of progress. Even where it is presented critically as an unfinished project, the idea of civilizational development remains. Finally, the stage of development represented by European societies, variously called commercial society, capitalist society or modern society, is understood as the proper focus of social theory. And it's the conflicts believed to be internal to that modern society that become the focus of subsequent developments in sociological thought. This established as what has become the standard focus within social theory on capitalist modernity and its divisions of class or gender. Racialized differences, the product of colonial encounters, are rendered as external impingements on modern social and political structures rather than as central to them and deriving from colonial domination. Yet capitalism developed out of colonialism and colonialism continues or continued to shape how it developed. For example, the first modern corporations operated under royal charters to exploit new colonial possessions. Hobbes and Locke in particular were direct material beneficiaries of colonial activities, with the latter, Locke, owning land in Carolina and serving on bodies administering colonies. Their involvement with colonialism directly shaped their thought and there's no need for an imagined capitalism to explain what they argue. Hobbes, for example, famously described a state of nature in which human beings expressed their aggressive drives to satisfy their self-interest in direct antagonism to others. Such a state involved, and I quote, continual fear and danger of violent death, and the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish and short. Hobbes described his account as a fiction, writing, and again I quote, there never was a such time, nor condition of war as this. But he also thought it was similar to the conditions of indigenous people native to lands of so-called European discovery. Contemporary accounts of indigenous people, which Locke was relying on, seriously misrepresent the degree of agriculture and social organisation found by the colonists. But this misrepresentation had a purpose and a consequence. Hobbes was seeking to establish the need for government in the state of society and to ground that government in agreement, a contract, among property holders for their mutual protection. Indigenous people were seen as an obstacle to Europeans establishing private property 
and are therefore placed as outside the contract for mutual protection. Their being assigned to the state of nature renders them rightfully subject to brute aggression, which is then presented as the already condition of their lives. Locke's treatment of the same issues is more subtle, but no less severe in its consequences. He sought to set out a God-given human right to self-determination, a right that in principle might include indigenous people. The issue for Locke was how that which was common, God-given to all, could justify being taken into private possession. The basic right to self-determination that Locke sets out was set out by him as a right to self-position where, and I quote, every man has a property in his own person. As a consequence, Locke wrote, and again quote from him, whatsoever that he removes out of the state that nature hath provided and left it in, he hath mixed his labour with and joined to it something that is his own and thereby makes it his property. The exercise of this right to private property was constrained only by what was due to others. Now Locke was writing at a time of extensive reorganisation of property and customary rights to use land in England and elsewhere. A process of enclosure through fencing off of land was removing these customary rights and creating a new kind of rural poor. Well, how did Locke justify this state of affairs? The answer lies in his treatment of what he called spoilage and in the role he attributed to money, but also in his recognition of the role of the colonies in providing opportunities for those displaced by enclosure at home. As Locke stated, the obligation to put land to use is expressed through possession and the potential displacement of others. Indigenous people lived on the land, not through the land, and left many of its fruits to spoil. In that sense, they had not taken it into possession. But wasn't accumulation of wealth a form of spoilage? And how could it be reconciled with leaving enough and as good in common for others? The answer for Locke lay in the development of money. Money could be put to other productive ventures and thus accumulation of money expanded possession in what was for Locke a virtuous circle. One of the uses of money was colonial expansion through ventures that absorbed the labour of the domestic population displaced by enclosure. What then of the enslavement of others? This is something that would seem to contradict directly the right of self-possession. The answer is found in Locke's arguments about political, that is civil society, and the state of nature. For Locke, Africans and other indigenous peoples existed in something akin to the state of nature, and the strife attributed to that condition meant that their warlike transgressions amongst themselves or against settlers, placed them in breach of natural rights. One consequence of this was that they could become the property of others, including other tribes, and as such traded as property by their owners. Now Locke famously wrote that in the beginning all the world was America, and more so than it is now. Later writers associated with the Scottish Enlightenment, but also writers in France like Montesquieu and Turgot, filled in the gaps between the state of nature and the modern state of society with other societal types, but they retained the basic structure of the early liberal accounts. Types of society could be distinguished by their different manner of subsistence, that is, different modes of the organisation of labour, together with associated forms of property. Essentially, four types of society came to be identified in this period, specifically hunting and gathering, pastoral or the nomadic tending of herds, settled agriculture and modern commercial society. 
In this formulation, enslavement was a feature of societies like ancient Greece, based on settled agriculture, or a feature of the encounter between hunting and gathering societies with their warlike natures. Commercial, modern society had its own internal logic, and this involved the abolition of slavery and serfdom in Europe. But at the same time, colonialism produced the expansion of forced labour, indeed the intro introduction of commercial, commodified, chattel slavery that was otherwise described as inimical to modernity. Thus the Scottish writer Miller wrote, and again quote, by what happy concurrence of events has the practice of slavery been so generally abolished in Europe? And in this way, he aligned slavery with serfdom and observed that liberty secured a more productive workforce. Now, of course, populations elsewhere resisted the incursions of Europeans, but their resistance indicated both their inhumanity and their need to be brought through the civilizing process. So the German social theorist Hegel, for example, justified the enslavement of Africans as positive for them at the same time as arguing that it would be negative for modern Europeans. And the reports of European traders and missionaries that ignored the hospitality afforded to Europeans on first contact were used by Hegel to represent the savagery of indigenous people in their opposition to their displacement from their land and being taken into possession as commodities. Their resistance to this fate was not a mark of their humanity and the reciprocal inhumanity of Europeans, but a further indication of their own lack of humanity. In this way, Europeans projected their own savagery onto others, presenting the gentler ways of life as, of others as intrinsically warlike and their resistance as aggressive rather than defensive. The barbarity of the incorporation of forced labour within market exchange relations was ignored. Now once this displacement had been made and the stadial theory of society represented an account of human development, European modernity could be represented to its members as the achievement of universal and universalizable freedom. Thank you.